Hi, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I am going to be relying heavily on my notes. I have been thinking and thinking about this for about close to two weeks. I was just looking up at the calendar because I finished this series on the 1st and I started it, I think, on May 22nd. What am I talking about? Okay, let's back it up. I'm going to put up the covers to 16 books in this series by Kim, excuse me, Angela Marsons. It's the Kim Stone Mystery Series. She's a detective inspector, and there are books 1 to 16, but about midway throughout the series, she wrote a prequel, so there are actually 17 books. Now, I came into this series on book 8, and I read 8, 9, 10, and 11. This was in 2019 and 2020. So... On my blog, you have very detailed reviews for 8 through 11, but what I'm going to do for this video is I am going to just summarize each book in the series to whet your appetite so hopefully you'll pick up the series like I did. I also wanted to tell you that the first seven or eight books are available at some of the online libraries. And then the other ones are available on Amazon, Audible, and, and other, like probably Barnes and Nobles and places like that. But if you want to get started with this, grab the first bunch of them from your library. Why not support your local library? So here's, like I said, I'm going to be relying heavily on my notes. Like I haven't put up this blog post yet, but let me give you an idea how much writing I've done. Okay, that's, a, that's one blog post. So that's why, like I said, I'm going to be relying heavily on my notes. Now, let me go back to the beginning. The four books that I read previously were Dying Truth, Fatal Promise, Dead Memories, and Child's Play. But this book, this series, when I got my hands on it as far, well, I should say one other thing. I think from book eight through book 16, every time they came up on NetGalley, I would download them with no intention on reading them until I could read them all in order. So I was collect, I had been collecting them for probably close to two years now. Um, but by the time I got to it, which was at the last week of May, I found out that there was a sequel. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. We're going to talk to you about the first the not sequel, prequel. Oh my goodness. It's not even pronounced sequel. It's sequel. Oh, I'm losing the plot here. It's called First Blood. Now, when I was compiling the screenshots, that's how I wrote. And not only that, but I went to Fantastic Fiction and then I went to Goodreads and I found out that even though First Blood was written in 2019, the series started a few years previously. So I put uh, first Blood first, and then I read the rest of the books in the series in order. Now, um, I'm glad that I did because in First Blood, we have Kim Stone uh, being assigned a new job in a new team. Now, when we meet Kim Stone, we find out she is a hard-wired cop with a bad attitude. And she has had more than one transfer over the years, and now she's been transferred over to Hallowsawind Station, and I believe it's in Wales. And I did spend two weeks in Yales, in Wales years ago, uh, 30 years ago at that. But anyway, uh, bottom line is um, she has a new team, and her team includes Bryant, who is a detective sergeant, I believe. Uh, Dawson is also a DS, a detective sergeant. And then you have a detective constable, and her name is Stacy. And then she has a new boss, Woody, who's a DCI, is the deputy, deputy chief inspector, if I'm saying it properly. So that's her new team. Now, the question is, will this team stick with Kim? Or will this be a something on uh, that she'll be starting over somewhere else yet again? Well, before she can even fully acclimate herself in her new circumstances, 
Their very first case that they are assigned is the body of a mutilated young man who sadly was a victim of pedophile. So they are trying to get, the team is trying to get to know each other, but more importantly, they're trying to get behind this, this, this murder to bring justice to the loss of this young life. And that's First Blood. Like I said, this video is just going to whet your appetite. It's not going to go into, I'm not going to go into uh, really, really heavily details. Then I moved on to book one, which was called Silent Scream. And in this book, we have Teresa Wyatt, who's dead. And now it's Kim's job to figure out why. Well, in the process of trying to solve this case, they learn about a 10-year pact that involved Teresa Wyatt and others. And because there was a 10-year pact and uh, as the case evolves, Teresa was killed because of, because of this pact, it only stands to reason that anybody else involved with this pact is going to end up losing their life. So uh, meanwhile, this case means a lot to Kim and we're going to under start to see Kim evolve right away in the very beginning of the series because she's full of anger. She has inherent anger, but she also has deep compassion and, and a wonderful sense of humanity. And it starts as, that's why I love binge reading series because, and I know I'm going off from talking about this book, because what happens in series is the continuity helps you to absorb the characters and their nature and, and why they are and what makes them tick. And that's what you have here. Now, I will say that this book caught me twice. And one of them was a line that I felt like I had to share. And, and it was, much as they wished to, they knew that they weren't capable of saving the whole world. But sometimes you just had to deal with what was right in front of you. So one of the characters made a decision based on that line in the in the in the book and I just I was really impressed by that. Now there was a shocking twist that I didn't expect and of course not only did it leave me eager for the next book. I'm sorry I'm just going to my other notes because I have two sets of notes. It really left me with a lump in my throat at the end. So I was really 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 moved by this book. All right, I'm just bringing up my second set of notes because I, I like I said I have two sets of notes because we're talking 17 books here. So we move on to Silent Screen. I'm sorry. We move on to Evil Games, book number two. I'm going to stop calling out the book numbers because I think as I get deeper into this video, I may, I may forget the numbers. But we move on to Evil Games. And here is where we meet the sociopathic psychologist, Dr. Alexander Thorne. Alexandra Thorne. She's an uncouth and unethical therapist who has a plot. And because she has a plot, she, this book reminded me of uh, those old uh, puppet shows where you, you do puppets with a string. Okay, that's what Alexander Thorne made me think of when I was reading Evil Games. She was playing with people's lives and um, while she while murders were taking place, Kim was working this case almost like putting a jigsaw puzzle together because there were lots of different pieces. But all the threads of these different pieces kept leading back to Dr. Alexander Thorne. And as a matter of fact, Alex Thorne literally became a thorn in Kim's side. And the thing is, I got, and yeah, I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler because it's going to come up, is we haven't seen the last of Alex Thorne. That's Evil Games. So I'm just trying to match up both sets of notes so I don't leave anything out. Then we're going to move on to Lost Girls. And uh, it starts off with Kim being asked personally to take or to oversee a kidnapping case. And she's asked to do this from a friend of hers. But the thing is, Kim doesn't have any friends. In fact, as the series evolves, the only real friend that Kim ever has is Bryant, her detective sergeant. He's a little bit older than her, happily married with a, at least one child. But other than Bryant, Kim doesn't have any friends. So how is it that someone 
says, I'm Kim's friend and I need Kim to oversee this case. So that's kind of intriguing because we're getting to see Kim's past in each book. We're seeing a little snippet here, a little snippet there, something about Kim's past. Well, what is this case? This is a case of Charlie and Amy, two nine-year-old girls, two nine-year-old best friends who are kidnapped. So both sets of parents are on the, sitting on the edge of their seat, wanting their children back. Now, it doesn't take long for Kim and her team, and this also includes, I think, what they call a liaison officer. So it's not only Kim and her team, but there's also a liaison officer involved. It doesn't take long to see that these parents are at odds with each other and that there are secrets. And it's, these ver it's those very secrets that present a challenge as far as finding those girls before it's too late. Then we're gonna move on to Play Dead. And now we have Kim who is supposed to receive an award for finding those girls alive. That's the last thing she wants because Kim does not like her attention on herself. But in this book, she is focused on finding a serial killer, stopping a serial killer. Now, um, in this particular case, in Play Dead, there are missing persons. And she is not only working with her team, but there's a reporter who becomes her uh, one of her nemesis. I don't know how to say nemesis plural. We're going to say nemesis. This, this, she has, there's a reporter here. And one of the notes that I made on this book is, oh, by the way, the reporter is Tracy Frost. I should tell you her name because Tracy Frost is a recurring character as the series evolves. But anyway, um, when I read a book, a mystery, a suspense, a thriller, I work really hard at trying to suss out the killer. Well, guess what? Couldn't do it in this book. Couldn't do it. But anyway, about Tracy, she finds herself in the killer's crosshairs. And, you know, any mystery, any thriller, any suspense is going to bring you lots of twists and turns. And that is definitely what happened in Play Dead. Really, really good book. A cold case involved with a current case. And it was really, really good. So I'm going to move on to Bloodlines. And guess what? Alexander Thorne is back. Okay. Now, she is, as mentioned already, a sociopathic psychologist. She's in prison. But because of uh, the specific case that Kim is on now, she needs to be able to get into the mind of the killer. And who better to help Kim get into the mind of the killer than her... Uh, Alex Thorne. So Kim is forced to talk to Alex in order to link the victims together. She knows she's dealing with a sick, a twisted individual, and who better to understand a sick and twisted individual than um, Alex Thorne. Now, this does strain Kim on a professional level because it's there's something that hits Kim hard. It hits Kim's team hard, and it, and it affects them all on a personal level. And it, this book it came to a heartbreaking ending, at least for me anyway. Then I'm going <clears> to <throat> move on to Dead Souls, which was were... By the way, I do have the dates in my planner. Uh, the series started in 2014, okay? The, um, and now, as I'm review, briefly reviewing each book, when we get to Dead Souls, we're up, we've moved up to 2017. So Miss Stone has been writing this series for quite some time. And, and not Miss Stone, Miss Marsons. Angela Marsons has been writing this series for quite some time. So we're going to talk about book number six, which is Dead Souls. And now in this particular book, um, Kim and her team are forced to work alongside another detective inspector and his team. And this is a challenge for Kim because Kim doesn't tolerate fools. <laughs> Not saying the other team are fools, but Kim doesn't tolerate people. And her little uh, team has become a family unit. But in this particular case, they are working on identifying bones that had been discovered. And because of, I, if I remember correctly, uh, the reason that 
Kim and this other team had to work together is where the body was found was a little bit on this side of the fence and a little bit on that side of the fence. So it could have been this person's case. It could have been that person's case. And when I say case, I mean territory, like boundary. Well, because this particular set of bones was found on a boundary line, so to speak, the two teams had to work together. And when I remember very clearly when they were trying to identify the bones that they found, I think it was the femur. And remember, I read all these books in a matter of like four or five days. I read 17 books in just a few days. But I, when Kim, when they're looking at the, and I'm holding up my leg as if you can see my leg, but as they're uh, looking at the body parts, Kim goes, oh, that's a third femur. And, and whoever was with Kim is like, and she goes, well, uh, we only have two legs, so that means there's at least two victims. I remember that very clearly. Now, at this point in my review, and I'm really relying heavily on my written notes, one thing I want to encourage readers to do is read every single acknowledgement at the end of every single book in this series. Read those acknowledgements by Angela Marsons. One of the things that she said is that she gives you the inspiration behind each and every book that she writes. She also mentions that she makes sure that the cases that Kim and her team deal with are different each and every time. Last thing I want to mention is that each book really reflects, reflects the climate of today's world and it makes each book relatable. So those are some of the things that I thought about midway, not quite midway. I was only a third into the series, but that those were some of the things that I noticed. All right, so we're gonna move on to Broken Bones. And um, injustice is something that Kim faces in this case, but it's more than that. It's she's facing someone from her childhood and this could really sideline Kim. Now, this book starts off with a baby being abandoned in front of the Hallowsawin police station that Kim and her team work at. After they find the abandoned baby, they also find the body of a 16-year-old girl. This book was hard because it dealt with prostitution, but it wasn't just that people were turning tricks to turn tricks. It was There was a reason behind it. It was a history behind it. And that's what made it really challenging. As a matter of fact, even with, uh, as the series had progressed, we start to see um, why this particular case was so challenging to, challenging to Kim. But then this, this particular book segues a little bit into why Kim had such a hard time with Dawson, one of her DS's, detective sergeants. So that was something that I made a note of in my personal notes about uh, that particular protagonist in this book was Dawson and how uh, Kim was facing desperation because somehow or another, this all linked to her past. So that was really, really, well, really well done. Then I'm moving on to Dying Truth and uh Book, when it first starts off, Kim is about to get a cast off her leg. That's the anxiety that she has. She wants to get back to work. But then the book says six days previously. So that means that this book took place over the course of just one week. Okay. Now, there in as this book starts off, we have a 13-year-old girl named Sadie Winters who apparently fell to her death. The question is, did Sadie jump or was something else going on? Well, guess who's back? Alex Thorne. Yes, she is. Now, Alex has a nefarious plan to bring Kim to ruin, even if it means ending Kim's life. But Kim isn't concerned for her life. She's concerned about why this child fell to her death. And that means talking to Alex Stone again, given privy to uh, how the killer might think. While that was happening, though, the book 
And I think it did it in italics had chapters where we had the killer's point of view. And one of the things that the killer said is Sadie Winters is the first, excuse me. So the reader knows that Sadie didn't commit suicide. It's up to Kim and her team to determine how, um, what happened to little Sadie Winters. Meanwhile, Kim is stressed out because Woody, her, her boss, is waiting for the performance appraisals of each of her team members. She needs Brian's, she needs Dawson's, and she needs Stacy's. And so part of the book talks about Kim working towards uh, giving them their, you know, their personal reviews. Then we're going to move on to Fatal Promise, which came out in 2018. And this book shows the team struggling with a huge loss, a huge loss that took place right at the end of the previous book, Dying Truth. So the books are written about six months apart. So if you were reading the series in order, you've had, as each book came out, you've had time to, to accept it or to deal with the loss of a team member. And now the team has to accept a new team member all while murders are still going on, the victims are still piling up, and Kim has to just stay on the job. Now, while this book is being, uh, you know, it's progressing, we have each team member who deals with the loss differently than the other. They all cope differently. But nonetheless, um, I, do, I don't know. I don't want to put a spoiler, so I'm, I stopped to think for a second. I'll just say it like this. This particular case reflects someone, a case that Kim had previously worked on. I'll leave it at that so that I don't put in any spoilers. Then we're going to move on to Dead Memories. And now here is um, here's a hard one. Kim and Brian are called to a crime scene. And if I'm not mistaken, Brian gets there before Kim. And now I'm a very visual person, so I can picture these things that I read as scenes playing in my head. Is Kim is like, you know, ready to go into the crime scene, right? Brian is like, no, Kim, don't go in. I got it. No. And Kim's like, what are you talking about? This, you know, I'm your boss. I'm, in a sense, I'm going into the crime scene. Well, she finds that... There are two teenagers handcuffed to a radiator. One of them is dead and one of them is near dead. Guess what? Somebody has decided to recreate the most traumatic events of Kim's past. It's at this point that I can tell you that Kim was a twin something happened to her twin brother, Mikey. When you read Dead Memories, which is appropriately titled, somebody has taken these horrific memories from Kim's past and replaying them. And in order for them to understand that, they hire or somebody that works with them is Allison, who's a profiler or a behaviorist. And Kim's not crazy about that science. But the case is very difficult because it is recreating these horrific events from her past. The fact remains, or the fact is, is someone seems to be aware of the very lowest of lows that Kim have experienced. So this was probably the most compelling book in the series. And to, just for my sake to tell you, it's book number 10, to me, pretty much the most compelling. Of course, you know, at the end of book number eight, that was that was hard. But book number ten was very compelling. Then we, so we're going to move on to Child's Play, uh, which is book number eleven, and the newest victim in this book is a woman who is murdered, and Kim is starting to work on solving this murder. And then there's another murder, and Kim is trying to discover after the victims are discovered, what could the link be between the victims? 
Well, she's able to discover that these victims were actual child prodigies, people who were, uh, were unable to live normal childhood because of whatever special talent or special gift that they had. So while she's working on that case, we have Penn. Penn is our newest DS, our newest team member, but he goes back to his old station, his old stomping grounds, and while there, he's working on trying to figure out what is behind the death of a young man. Now, what I like about the Kim Stone series is throughout different books in the series, we learn a little bit more about each character. Well, in this case, we learn a little bit more about Penn, and I love that. And for a police procedural novel, this one is just as impressive as every other one in the series. Then we're gonna move on to Killing Mine, okay? This is San Samantha Brown. Now, that's the victim. Did she commit suicide? Okay. Now, Kim, of course, doesn't believe that suicide is a cause of Kim Stone's, excuse me, of uh, Samantha Brown's death. She learns something chilling. What she learns is that there's a cult involved. This cult is called Unity Farm. And she knows one way or another that this cult is involved. And like in any case that you read about, watch on television or hear it in the news, you are victims of, not victims, that's a harsh word, but the members of cults are reluctant to tell the faults of what's going on inside. So Kim has to work really hard. And I like the way they go about solving this case. They do something a little bit different, but I won't, I won't uh, spoil it for you. But... While Kim's working on this one, we have Bryant. Bryant is in a battle of his own. He's fighting to keep a man that has been locked up for 25 years in prison. The man is up for parole, but Bryant feels that he has not, uh, there's, uh, I forgot what that word is when a person uh, learns from their crime and their, uh, then they're not going to commit any more crimes. Recidivism, maybe? that's That might be the word I'm thinking of. Well, Brian doesn't believe that of this particular man. And he feels that if this man gets out of prison, then he's going to kill again. So I, Brian is working on that. And I do want to mention a side note, and I do mention it um, in my written review as well, is at the very end of this book, Bryant is home and he's talking to his wife, Jenny. And Jenny's in the mean, meanwhile is working on her diamond painting. Well, diamond painting, to see that in a book just tickled me pink. I have diamond paintings hanging up in my office, in my living room, my kitchen, my bathrooms. Yeah, I've got diamond, my bedroom. Yeah, I love diamond painting. So that's kind of neat that it was included in this book. Even just, you know, just a couple of lines. Then we're going to move on to Deadly Cry. We have three women that were killed in three days. Boom, boom, boom. Well, when the police are going to the home, well, Kim and her team are going to the home, homes of the uh, family victims, the victims' families, one of the people that she approaches and says, well, where's Archie? And Kim is like, well, who's Archie? She said, Archie is our six-year-old son. If my wife was killed, where's my Archie? So now Kim has a race against time trying to find Archie. What happened to Archie? And in the process of working this case, she starts working with Allison, who is a profi profiler or a behaviorist. And uh, Kim's not all that fond, not only of Allison herself, but Kim's not all that fond of the whole uh, science behind profiling. Um, but they're trying to stop any more murders from taking place and hopefully, hopefully hoping to find this body, excuse me, the little boy Archie before it's too late. So that is Deadly Cry. Okay, I just have to edit in this part because I was talking about Twist, Twisted Lies and my husband started using the blender. So if this video is a little choppy right here, that's why. Okay, so here we have the case of two victims who Kim must find out what the link is in these victims. And the thing is, while Kim is working on this case, 
somebody that Kim really wasn't crazy about named Tracy Frost, the reporter or the journalist is as uh, Kim is told by her boss that she must help Tracy with Tracy's inquiry about a case. So Kim has this case going on over here, but Tracy knows or, or thinks she knows of something that happened. And the only way that she, she can get to the bottom of this is if she gets help from the police or in this case, Kim. And that's pretty much what this book was uh, all about is them working together, but not without shocking twists and all kinds of things happening that happen in these books, all different than every other book in the series. So I just wanted to throw that one in. I know this is probably one of the more incomplete ones, but I'm trying to edit this and I realize I left this book out. Thanks. All right, I readjusted my camera. So we're moving on to uh, Stolen Ones. That's, this is book number 15. And guess who is back? Yes, I've already said that in this video. That would be Dr. Alexander Thorne. She's back and she is still determined to figure out a way to take him down. But let's talk about Kim's current case. We have Alice and Lowe. We have Alex. Okay. And now we have the current murder. But our author, Angela Marsons, did something different. At the very beginning of this book, they have the killer in custody. So why do they still have a case? Why can't they just go on to the next one? Well, there's somebody still missing, and there might just be a chance for Kim and her team to find that person alive. All while Kim is working and talking to this killer, Alex is plotting, Alex is planning, Alex is devious. Because she's gonna ruin Kim if it's the last thing she does. She might even go ahead and uh, make sure Kim doesn't survive this. But anyway, I wanna talk about one thing really quickly. It's called Lima syndrome. Never heard of it before. Lima or Lima? might be Lima, like Lima beans. So we'll say Lima, the Lima syndrome. It's the opposite of Stockholm syndrome. And we, we, we've, we some of us that grew up like uh, in the 60s, 70s, we, we learned about Stockholm syndrome is where the victim becomes attached to the kidnapper. Well, in this book, the Lima syndrome, we have the captor who becomes attached to the victim or the subject. So that, 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 that was very interesting. And as a matter of fact, the example that's used in the book is Beauty and the Beast, how Beauty was, uh, I mean, how Beast, the Beast fell in love with Beauty. So I, I thought that was really good. That was a great, great book. Uh, like I said, you have a couple of different things. You have the killer's point of view. You already know who the killer is. Kim's trying to find out where this victim is. And then you have the Lima syndrome. So lots of good things in this book. Now, book number 16, which is technically the 17th book, is Kim's har most harrowing case of all, okay? Um, something from her past comes up yet again, and this is the point that she will find herself in grave danger. Now, it starts off with the fact that there is a fire, but the fire is not the only thing that Kim finds. When they get to the victims, there's four victims, a wife, a husband, and two children. Apparently, the wife killed the husband and children and then herself. But that's not what Kim and her team ascertain. So it takes a lot of uh, hunting for answers, but Kim finds those very, very answers. So this was a great book with a riveting conclusion, one that made me super, super eager to get to book number 17 when it comes out. And I was looking at uh, the calendar and these look like they come out about every six months. So if there was a book in May, 
I would suggest, I would venture to say there'll probably be a book in September, which means that I'll probably get it by mid July. So I'm excited to read it. Now, um, I wanted to just also add at the, we're closing at the end of this video, but um, I, again, I want to encourage readers to read the acknowledgements at the end of each book because you get to see Kim and her team work cases that are as different as night and day. And then you have your regulars, Kim, Brian, Stacy, uh, you have um, Woody and you have Tracy Frost and now you have Penn. Then you've got the pain in the butt psychologist, Alex Thorne. Yeah, yeah. So I would say that if you want a compelling compelling series. Um, I'm going to say this series comes second to the uh, J.D. Robb in Death series that I have some favorite series. J.D. Robb in Death, Catherine Coulter's uh, FBI series, uh, um, Iris Johansson's Eve Duncan series, uh, James Patterson, Alex Frost series. So I've got some great series up there that I've loved. This one here, it's pushing its way up to the top, okay? So that's all I'm gonna say. I know this is a very long video. I don't know how many of you are gonna get to the end, but I felt it was only fair to summarize to the best of my ability, all the books in the series. And that'll be it for now. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.